And with that, I'd like to introduce um, from Water Systems Consulting, Elaine Carlson, uh, who's here to give you a presentation tonight on uh, the staff update of the Replenish project. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, David mentioned I'm Lane Carlson with Water Systems Consulting. I'm a consultant program manager for Big Bear, working with the agency team and our consultant team to manage and coordinate all the parallel activities that are ongoing to keep this project moving forward. Can I give you an update tonight? I'm going to walk through um, some of the key um, initiatives that are ongoing right now. Um, can we take questions at the end? And also feel free to stop me at any time. Oh, bear with me. The first time we have our update on the pilot study and the environmental review process. Those are two key things for other people to have, and there's been some significant progress in recent months. Um, so more to share there. And then a recap of the regulatory timeline, grant funding, to share some new resources that have been developed to characterize project benefits and share that out. Um, and then also review the program schedule. So for the pilot study, um, just to note, I'm going to reorder these slides a little bit just to make sure it flows. So I'm getting here to slide six if anyone's following the moment in the packet. And I'll come back to slide five at the end. So I want to start with a recap of the advanced purification facility that is really the central component of our clinic right there. The existing barber treatment plan is going to be supplemented with a full advanced treatment facility that includes these four processes, nutrient removal, ultrafiltration, reverse osmosis, and then UV disinfection in an advanced oxidation process. In the next slides, I'll explain a little bit more about what each of those are. This treatment train is really state-of-the-art. This is the best available treatment for water reuse projects. There are many projects in California who are using this treatment train, and it's well established within the regulations that, that, that it's effective. And so some projects um, may, you know, leveraging the performance that we've seen in other places, may move forward without doing demonstration testing. However, for replenish the we feel that it's important to actually test these facilities on site. Um, for a few reasons. Um, there are a couple unique things about this project. And one is the really low discharge requirements that we expect for the lake. We have to get those nutrient levels very low um, in order to protect the water quality. And then also the cold climate. Um, some of these biological processes don't perform as well in cold climate. So we really need to make sure that we have a year round process that can meet those discharge requirements because it's so important to the success of the program. So the purpose of bringing those facilities on site primarily is to demonstrate the performance of this process for these site-specific conditions and regulatory agencies. The vendors are really confident that they can meet the design criteria, um, but we really need to see that and demonstrate it here, and that's going to give the project team and the regulators a lot more confidence moving forward. And we also want to make sure that this treatment process, as I said, this is the best available treatment process, um, to confirm that it's going to be viable to meet those target treatment levels. And then finally, we want to quantify the total system recovery for product water. We'll see a little bit more about that in the next slide. But because we're using a membrane reverse osmosis product, there is some brine waste. And so we're not recovering 100% of the water. Um, it's really important for us to figure out what that mix is so that we can get the right facility sizes. So I'll talk a little bit more about that on the next slides. So this biological nutrient removal process, this is going to be the first um, additional process after Barra's existing treatment. And this is a biological, chemical, and physical process that's going to remove most of the organics and help us get those nitrogen and phosphorus levels a lot lower. And this is the one that's going to be the most sensitive to cold weather performance. So we're going to bring this out first. Um, you'll see on the timeline, this is going to be um, on site here in February, and that will start up still with cold weather so we can verify both cold weather and spring performance. That process is going to be followed by ultrafiltration, which is a membrane process that removes suspended follows and bacteria from the water. From there, it's going to go to a reverse osmosis process. This is a high pressure membrane with those really, really small pore sizes. It's going to remove 
additional ingredients like salt, bacteria, viruses, um, in the pharmaceuticals and personal care products that um, are often a concern. This is the process that generates the brine waste that we'll need to deal with um, on site. So all of these processes are going to be piloted on site. And then the final one is a UV disinfection and advanced oxidation process. And this is where UV light is combined with an oxidant to create oxidizing radicals. And so what they do is they attack and they decompose any remaining contaminants in the water. So it breaks them down so that they're no longer harmful. This is the process that's required for most of our um, indirect potable reuse type products. Um, and it's the best available technology. And it's combined with UV light that also provides disinfectant for the water. So those four processes combined are going to produce what the industry knows as purified water. It is higher in quality than drinking water. It meets all federal and state regulations. And so throughout this treatment process that we're going to pilot, we'll be able to collect that data and show what the water looks like before it goes in and after it comes out of all these processes to really prove the purity of the water that's being produced um, to be able to show that to the regulators. Um, as well as test for some of those um, things that we often get questions about, right? Like the pharmaceuticals and the personal care products. We'll be able to have data to really show those removals um, and demonstrate the level of safety that this treatment provides. Before we move on, can I ask you a question? Yes. Um, knowing how reverse osmosis works on ultrafiltration seems like an extra step. Well, can I explain I, the reason why it's there. I can, yeah. So the, the pore sizes on the reverse osmosis membranes are very, very small. Um, one way that's used to describe it is it's one three hundredth the size of a human hair. And so that additional sort of pretreatment step, the ultra filtration, is needed um, to clean up the water so that those membranes don't get clogged. So we're um, you know, removing more of those impurities so that those reverse osmosis membranes can be more effective. Okay. Um, so the final process, um, and this doesn't have anything to do with producing water, but this is the brine management process that's going to help deal with the, the brine waste that's generated from the RO. Um, and so what we're looking at is the brine minimization process. So that includes um, the first step here. It's an additional small RO process, basically. And then it goes into what we call a pelletizer that's going to produce like a solid salt pellet that can be disposed of. There is still a small liquid brine stream from this process, and the concept is to build constructed operation ponds on site here at Barwa on the available land and evaporate that off. And so the really key thing with piloting this piece of equipment is to confirm um, vendors are telling us that they can get um, up to 98% total recovery. So only 2% of the water that we're treated is going for disposal and for evaporation. Um, they would be confident in that, but we need to confirm that because it dictates the size of the evaporation ponds that get constructed on site. Um, and as you can imagine, uh, the land available is a potential constraint there. Um, and also we want to confirm that that is within budget. So this particular process, we are having a hard time getting on site to pilot. Um, the vendor quotes came in significantly higher than anticipated. However, uh, the vendor um, that there's really only one vendor that makes this uh, product, and they're working with us trying to figure out more creative ways. And what they propose is actually to do the facility or to do the pilot at their research and development facility in Israel. So the concept is that we would ship barrels of the purified water that's produced from the pilot here to their research and development facility and they'll do the testing on site of this equipment. We anticipate that the cost um, and timeline for that will be significantly lower than trying to do that pilot on site. We're still in initial conversations with that vendor trying to sort that out, but that looks like a really promising um, opportunity to reduce the cost of this pilot program. Another question? Yes. The uh, brine that's produced, uh, is that uh, just called salt pure sodium? It's um, is there more or some, some non sodium, so whatever it is, an exalt. Um, and the only reason why that I'm asking the question right now that um, Ryan has actually put on our roads before it snows, 
So the same type of brine, it's different types of brine. I, th I think it will include some of the same compounds, but it you know it'll also include some of those additional impurities that are filtered out through the reverse osmosis process. Um, so I, I don't have a solid answer for you, but part of the um, piloting process is going to be to sample that brine to understand what it's made up of, what those constituents are, um, and make sure that we'll be able to dispose of it in conventional ways. Um, we don't anticipate that um, they're hazardous or difficult to dispose of. So uh, I guess I'm leading to could be used on roads if it's the right content. I am not aware of an application where that's been done. However, the um, the pellets that this uh, pelletizer can produce um, has been known to be used in industrial process processes. So, for example, um, a batch plant for concrete um, might be an opportunity. So that is something that we're going to look into as we get further um, after the pilot to see, you know, what is the composition of these pellets and is it a marketable product? Because it may be. I'm not aware of anyone that's used it for road de-icing, but there are some other industrial um, applications potentially to avoid just disposing of it. Thank you. I have a question. Sure. Yes. Uh, so, so, so what I understand is, then is, is that you're going to just take several sample barrels and ship it off to Israel and the balance is just turned right back into the stream that goes out to the CERN. Is that right there? Correct. Yes. Uh, quick question. Yes, John. Uh, that sample is going to be taken after uh, the other two processes before, correct? After, yeah. So it'll be taken after um, all of up through the UV advanced oxidation. So at that point, it's considered purified water. So we're going to send samples of the purified water that's produced by the pilot. Sorry, the purified water goes back into um, the plant. The RO um, reject that comes from the RO process is what we'll, we'll store up and send to Israel. I understand. The other question I have is, uh, do we know what the life expectancy or the prediction of life expectancy for the filters are? Yeah, the filters. So we have a few different filters in the um, in the system. So there's there's membrane uh, cartridges basically as part of the ultrafiltration yeah. and the R as well. And that's what I was referring to was the membrane cartridge. Yeah. So it I think it varies a bit by vendor as well. And I, I can't remember the number offhand. Those replacement costs are included in the O and M. Um, I think it's on the range of about ten years. Um, it, it does depend a little bit by vendor, um, but that's kind of the average of what we're seeing. Okay, yeah, I'd like to see the on those replacement at some point. Yeah, we can provide additional detail on that. We have that. Thank you. That's all I have. Okay, so I'll move on to the pilot plan timeline. Um, in October, uh, 2022, we started the pilot study planning and requested proposals from various vendors um, to bring the equipment up here for testing. And um, while the vendor responses took a little bit longer than we anticipated, we're happy to report that signed the first agreement here in January, and the denitrification filters are um, currently. Uh, plans to be shipped here to Barwa and arrive in February for startup. And then the additional processes um, will um, be added after that. Um, at about a two weeks spacing in between just to get stuff, time to get them started up. Um, and then starting in March, we can start doing some water quality monitoring where we're taking water quality samples upstream of the pilot plant at key places in between and on the affluent. Uh, so we have data on the quality and the performance of each of these treatment processes. And we plan to run that pilot through um, probably about early July. We'd also like to capture a couple of your peak holiday weeks just to see if there are any changes in performance when those flows get a little bit higher. Um, so running past the 4th of July um, and including Memorial Day should give us a pretty good picture of kind of the range of flows, um, as well as some, some winter temperatures and then, and then into spring and summer. So we'll wrap up the pilot around July 
Um, and then it'll take a little bit longer to get all the data back and do a pilot and report. But you'll see there in June, we have a milestone for start final design. We do anticipate that by that point in the pilot, we'll have enough data to really see how the performance of these processes are working. And we'll be able to initiate those next phases of design. I have one more question. When you talk about the evaporation pond, and maybe this is a question for David, is there just not enough room on site to to handle the, the amount of brine that comes out of the system? Yeah, so the, the amount of brine that we're talking about, yeah, I mean, it's going to take, you know, I think it's like 27 acres is the number. Okay. So you're talking about a very large footprint for the evaporation pond. Um, I would say um, basically most of the property that we actually have. Okay. Uh, it balance of the property that we actually have. So for that reason, it is important that we make sure to demonstrate those high levels of removal, that 98% recovery that I was talking about, because if the process does generate more brine than that, and it's too much brine to handle on site, that could become a challenge figuring out different ways to, to manage that brine. Again, the vendors are really confident that they can keep those numbers, um, but it's really important that we confirm that. So we should have that data here by the summer. Any questions on the piloting process before we move on in the next section? Okay, so environmental documentation, this is the other activity that's on the code app because we have to have the CEQA document adopted before we can apply for some of the funding programs. Um, and obviously as well before construction, but this really is guiding um, some of the funding time around. So in December, we um, really kicked this process off, issued the notice of preparation for the CEQA document. Um, that included a project description that went out for public review. In January, there were two scoping meetings, um, one at DWP's office and one here at Barwa. And the purpose of those scoping meetings was just to request public input on any issues that the public thinks should be evaluated in the IR. Um, and so most of those, I'll show you on the next slide, generally the feedback that we have, most of those things we anticipated and already um, had planned within the analysis. So we'll be working with the, um, the environmental consultant over the next few months. Um, they're completing the analysis. We'll make sure that we incorporate appropriate responses to the comments that were received from the public. Um, and we anticipate a draft EIR going out for public review around July. Um, There'll be at least a 30 day process um, where that's open for public comment, and those comments will be incorporated. And along about October, we anticipate being able to do a final EIR. Um, there's a public hearing to adopt that. Um, and from there, we'll hand off the CEQA documents to a federal agency where uh, we anticipate that it'll be the, the Bureau of Reclamation today. Um, because of the federal funding for the program, those agencies um, need to do their own federal environmental clearance process, um, and they don't get that started until after seek was done. Um, and that could take, you know, somewhere in the range of, of six months, potentially. Um, but this is all still completed well ahead of when anticipated construction begins. Um, so really, this is, um, you know, we're, we're keeping this moving uh, to allow us to get those funding um, opportunities. Another question for you. Um, once the, the draft uh, EIR is published and you have your public comments, I mean, you've got two months in there. Respond to public comments and do all your public notice that's required by law to get that in October. I, I just, you know, just like to point out to you that's a very aggressive timetable for an EIR. For replying to comments. Yes. And, yeah. and for getting it on an agenda based on you know, um, public noticing requirements. I mean, I'm not sure, but I'm pretty positive this is probably subject to the tribal notification, which is a 90 day notification. So I'm pointing that out to you that you may want to check tribal notification requirements for that. Sorry, you're right. I'm cutting out. Tribal, tribal, tribal notification is 90 days. So I, I, I'm going to assume that this definitely is probably part of that process and that you need to. Build that in. 
at the public yeah. hearing process. I know the environmental team um, has already started the tribal notification process, um, and I do believe that that's built in here. But we will, we will, to your point, verify um, with them. And the the, ju the July date for the draft EIR is um, we hope that that's conservative. In reality, we're hopeful that that will go out sooner. Um, and if if that's if that's the case, that'll give us a little bit more buffer on that adoption. Um, but I'll share your comments with the environmental team. Thank you. So just a kind of overview of the nature of the comments that we heard from the environmental review scoping comments. And again, these are things that people are basically saying, hey, I want you to look at this for the EIR. I want you to evaluate what these impacts are so that when the draft EIR comes out, um, that analysis will be included. Um, and hopefully this will limit the, the extent of the comments that we get on the draft EIR if we're able to address these ahead of time. Um, so the main things were, you know, just questions about water quality impacts in Big Bear Lake and then downstream for the water that's released from the dam. Um, and again, I just walked you through the treatment process. And so I think um, we'll also have some data from the pilot to include at that point to be able to demonstrate how pure this water is um, and it's just being able to resolve water quality concerns. Um, we do also plan to meet with some of the down downstream stakeholders to share more information about the project and make sure that we understand any concerns that can resolve those at the time. Um, there were some comments on reduced flow to Lucerne Valley. Um, we certainly expected that. Um, a few more details than we had anticipated, asking about you know, dust control for the site um, and some things like that. So but we have a meeting tomorrow with the environmental team to address. Um, we're going to talk about how those things will be addressed in the EIR. Um, but again, we have data available to address that, and we had anticipated that in the analysis. Um, some comments on just making sure that there's consistency with the 1977 judgment for Big Bear Lake, um, which of course is an ongoing process. Questions about brine um, energy use and encouragement to include renewable energy resources. Um, and then a letter to make sure that we are aware of the requirements to consult with Native American tribes. Um, which, of course, the environmental team is. Um, and then finally, three letters of support from local residents who took the time to just write a note of encouragement. So that's always nice to see. Any questions on environmental review for the moment? So the regulatory process is ongoing. Um, this slide is basically a picture of where we've been. And it's been a kind of a long path. So we first started talking to the regulators about this project in January 2019. Um, and then in February 2020, we submitted the official permit application, which is known as the report of waste discharge. And so the time in between initiating that contact and submitting the report of waste discharge was really the most critical um, activity to coordinate with the regional board. That's when we're meeting with them and we're talking with them to understand how they're going to regulate this project, what the discharge requirements might be. Um, and the other thing that we're doing during that time is really trying to figure out if there were any ways to reduce the cost of the, pro the, cost of the project. Um, we looked at doing lower levels of treatment, not as many processes. And um, ultimately, through a combination of you know, the lake model analysis, discussions with the regional board, the Division of Drinking Water, and review of the regulations, it became clear that full advanced treatment was the only way to proceed with this project. And so it did take a while to get to that point, um, but we now have confidence that we do have the right scope of improvements that are needed for this project to be successful. And, you know, following the submittal of that permit application, we had a little bit of back and forth, the regional board providing comments, we're providing responses. Um, but in December, regional board staff did confirm their approach to regulate the project would be to require that full advanced treatment and some additional water quality monitoring. And so at this point, we do feel like we have a pretty solid understanding of what those discharge requirements would be. Um, although there's still, I'll show you on the next slide, quite a few more steps in the process to actually get the permit. Um, this is no longer on the critical path because we do understand um, what we anticipate those requirements would be. I'm oh, sorry, another question. Um, so when you say regional board staff confirm their approach, 
that is that a written letter from their director or their board? Yeah, it's, it's an email from the lead water quality engineer who is on this case. Um, Ultimately, issuing a permit is a decision of the elected board itself, right? And so staff can't actually tell us, yes, I will issue you a permit. That's not their legal decision. Uh, but what they did tell us was, yes, that's how we see it. That's what staff intends to recommend to the board. And that's how we um, would intend to regulate the project. Ultimately, it's a board decision. There's a, they, they did request additional data as well. Um, water quality data, um, and I'll show you on the next slide. There, you know, quite a few more steps to the process, um, but I think that that's probably as far as staff really felt it was appropriate to go. Thank you. So, um, with the water quality board, with um, the process we have to go through to purify the water, um, because initially started off it wasn't as elaborate. In, and I'm sure that you have experts who came up with the initial ideas. They have their experts. Is there, um, is there science behind it that says that, that this expense is worth doing this to the water before it goes in? Or is it uh, is this a, a opinion or science? Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, um, there are a few different things that are triggering this level of treatment, and one of them is the discharge requirements um, to the lake. And those numbers are established in um, a basin plan, which is a, a legal document governing um, protection of environmental uh, quality. And those standards were set, you know, probably back in the 60s and 70s when you know, the lake was very pure and before there was, um, you know, some of the development and the runoff that we see now. And so um, the federal water quality laws prohibit degradation of water quality. And so um, in order to meet those water quality regulations that are written into the basin plan, we do have to do 100% RO. That is the only way to get the nutrients down to the levels that are required um, because of you know, nutrient impairments in the lake, the, the TMDL, the total maximum daily load that's been um, regulating discharges to the lake. So initially we we did believe that we would have to do 100% RO. During the, the early phases of coordinating with the regional board, we tested if there were any other ways, if there were any more creative regulatory pathways to get off of that, because that is a costly process. Um, and ultimately, um, I came to understand that there, there wouldn't be any way that that staff was willing to permit based on the data that was available to them and their need to uphold those federal water quality laws. More recently, um, that final process, the, the UV advanced oxidation process, that was added in response to um, concerns about constituents of emerging concern, and this came from the Division of Water. Um, and the science on that is evolving, right? Our, our ability to test and detect those constituents and to understand the impact on human health, um, the industry is still learning more about that. And so a lot of those things aren't regulated yet, um, but they're, they're on everyone's mind. And so, that is an evolving science that doesn't yet have that trigger that's telling us you absolutely must do this. Um, however, it was clear that the regulators would not be willing to permit the project unless that component was added because they felt that it was necessary to protect public health. Does that answer your question? It, it does. It, it, I, I appreciate that. Okay. Um, it, essentially, the water quality in your what is your thought on water quality of the lake once we start putting water in? It seems like, in my opinion, um, it would improve over a period of time. Yes. Um, we did engage um, a limnologist, Dr. Michael Anderson, um, who's done um, analysis on Big Bear Lake um, historically and also in Canyon Lake. It's very well respected by the regional board. And so we had the pleasure of having him on our team. He developed a lake model 
um, where he um, evaluated the impacts of different levels of discharge. And so we did have him look at a lower level of discharge, like if we only did, you know, ultrafiltration and we didn't do our own. And his model determined that that would have degraded the water quality in the lake. But the project that we have proposed now with full advanced treatment um, is the, the quality that we're putting into the lake is much, much better than the watershed runoff, right? Which is the other water source of the lake. And so it will improve the quality of the lake. When the model was done, was it done at different levels of the lake? Yes, it was done over a period um, between, I think he looked at 2009 to 2019. Um, that was the longest period where sufficient data was available to calibrate the model. Um, most of the water master and lake analysis goes back to 1977. We didn't have the calibration data. So we did look at that period. So 2009, right, lake levels went up, 2011, and then dropped to uh, record lows around 2018. So that's the period of time that he looked at, and he did a, a time series model. Um, so it did show uh, a longer term average. That was the longest period that we had data for, but it happens to include, you know, a full lake and a record low. Thank you. Is that what you were asking? Okay. Yes. Lake levels or levels within the lake? No, uh, lake levels and how the quality of water affects if you have a half full lake or a full full lake. Yes. And a quick one. Yeah. Um, what does it entail as far as the monitoring plan? What steps are they looking for? Um, that is something that we anticipate negotiating with the regional board over time. So um, right now in the regulations for um, surface water augmentation, which is not what this project is doing. However, that is an existing regulation that the regional board has access to. There's a list of constituents that need to be monitored. And so that's our starting point. So what we're doing right now is um, getting quotes from laboratories to um, determine the cost of doing that monitoring plan. And then we're gonna go talk with the regional board um, and see if we can optimize, you know, kind of fine tune what they're asking for at this phase of the project. Um, so that we, you know, can can get them enough data to feel confident moving forward, but make sure that we're limiting the cost um, to the extent that we can. So that'll be in the short term um, to get them enough data to issue a permit. And then two years before the project starts up, and then two years after uh, the discharge begins, there's typically some additional monitor requirements. You monitor more often. And then if you're not seeing some of these constituents in the water, then you can reduce your monitoring. Um, and so there is an established plan for other types of projects. And our anticipation is that we may be able to use um, some of our pilot data to demonstrate the purity of the water um, and use that to potentially negotiate lesser monitoring to reduce the cost. Just to follow up, I'm sorry. The, uh, when you monitor, uh, you're monitoring the water that is going in, not the, just the lake. What, what, what water are you monitoring? Actually both. Yeah, thank you for asking. So we need to monitor the effluent. So in the short term while the pilot um, is running, we're going to be taking data, um, taking samples of that effluent so that we can demonstrate what the quality of this purified water would be. So that's one data set. And then we do also need to monitor the existing water quality in the lake to provide a more comprehensive baseline, that they call it, um, so that they can compare over time. Um, if there are any changes in water quality. Okay. okay, so the next steps, as I mentioned, we are finalizing a monitoring plan. Um, we're going to work with the regional board to review that um, and anticipate that we might start those monitoring efforts around March. Certainly, we'll be testing the pilot effluent, um, and we may start late monitoring at that time as well. Um, we're going to collect that data over the course of, um, you know, a few quarters so that we're getting within the lake some seasonal data. Um, submit that to the regional board and then we're anticipating that at that point they would deem the application complete and then they would be able to draft an administrative order um, sort of in the middle of, in the middle of next year. And that would be, that's kind of an extra step that we're asking for is that um, administrative order and that's um, kind of an internal draft so that we have an opportunity to see what the permit terms are and negotiate them um, before it goes out to the tenant order. When the tenant order is issued, that goes out for public comment. Um, 
I just got the review period, and then they would, the, the regional board would be um, asked to adopt that order uh, following that. So there's still quite a few more steps in the process, but um, we think that we've allowed sufficient time and we're showing that permit approval at about April 2025. And so there's still a significant buffer before the program starts up in early January 2027. Um, you don't need the permit until you start discharging. Um, and many programs don't even apply for it until closer to discharge, but given the complexity, we wanted to start this process sooner. Okay, so moving on to grant funding. Um, I do not have any new grants to announce for you today. Um, so this is a recap of information you've seen um, yet, I'll say. Um, so because we have Title 16 funding, we know that federal grants can cover up to 25% of the total project costs of the Title 16 limitation. Currently, um, FARA has 7% state grants, 16% in federal grants, um, and an additional 9% that we anticipate. So that, that 16 and the 9 gets us to that 25% federal cap. Um, and we believe we'll get that additional 9% from Title 16. They have another funding round that'll come out this year. The application will probably in June. And so the remaining funds we'll be looking at other financing um, and really focusing on state grants. Your opportunity going forward is the state grants to leverage that federal funding. Um, and, I'll, and I'll talk in a little bit um, where we're going to focus those efforts. So this is just a recap of the grants that have been we've been successful on to date. Most of them are officially awarded. A couple of them are still in those preliminary stages that grant agreements aren't accepted yet, but the funding's been out. So our big opportunities um, going forward for grants, again, is going to be getting the rest of that 9% from Title 16 federal grants. And then we're actively evaluating additional state grant opportunities. There's a fair amount of money that's being allocated to funding agencies. And based on some work we're doing with other agencies around the state, we're hearing that the DWR is really looking to allocate a lot of that funding toward um, climate adaptation and resilience efforts, um, as well as water reuse. And this project fits generally well with, with all of um, those types of criteria that are usually applied for those funding opportunities. So we're really actively watching that um, and seeing how those agencies are going to be allocating the funds. Um, we don't currently have um, a recommended grant program that we're looking at for the state, but I think very soon um, there'll be some specific opportunities to consider. And we're also investing in the Clean Water State Revolving Fund. And while that is a loan program, and it takes a very long time to get through the process, they do have loan forgiveness opportunities, which is essentially a grant. And so that's the reason that we would potentially look at that as a supplemental um, source. And um, disadvantaged communities get to take a little bit of a shortcut over the timeline. You see it about maybe six months in a two, two and a half year process. Um, so we believe the project would be eligible for that. So that's something that we're talking to staff about. Um, no decisions have been made there or formal recommendations. That is a potential one. Okay, so next, show you a few new slides that were developed, um, just as resources to share uh, more about the project benefits. As this program gains momentum, we do more public presentations, um, more stakeholder meetings, um, and so having some, some additional information to share, I think will be helpful. So this is kind of a refresh of the map you've seen that really highlights the different components of the project um, throughout the valley. And so first, of course, we're producing the new purified water source at Arwa. And um, one option is to replace the existing uh, shade pond water source with this water. And I know this here is a future option because this, this discharge would be part of the NPDES discharge application. So same permit as the lake discharge, but it requires a whole second set of analysis. And so we've been focusing on the lake discharge to make sure um, that we can move that forward. And we have a whole lot of work um, so far on the shape on analysis. So we're kind of at the point where we could really start to dig into that. Um, but the project team is taking a step back and really thinking about, you know, is that the most cost effective way to use a small portion of this water? And so I just, I'm noting it as a future option because I think that's under further consideration.
And so then um, all of the water produced um, would go into Stanfield Marsh, which of course flows into the Bigger Lake. 120 acre feet would go to replace an irrigation water source for the golf course, which is noted as a groundwater benefit um, due to replacing that source as kind of an in lieu of charge. Um, recent conversations um, have led to including a new water source for the bike park. And then, of course, the replenishment for the groundwater basin in Sand Canyon. And then there are some additional downstream benefits. When the lake levels are higher, there, of course, will be more downstream businesses. And the project team has partnered, um, well, not actually partnered, but it's been talking about Valley District, which is a regional agency down the San Bernardino area. And they believe that they can capture you know, any water that's released during high lake levels. They can capture some of that water to recharge their basin um, in the San Bernardino area. So there's some additional downstream benefits for that water that can be used here locally. So and another, another question for you, um, yeah. Dave, Dave, you can help me with this. When you say new bike park, that's at Bear Mountain? That's correct. So, you know, Bear Mountain had this issue years ago with the Spotted Owl. Has that been resolved for them to be able to open that up in the summertime? Or do you know? Uh, they've been opening up those, this is on the summit. Um, this is at Summit or Bear Mountain? That's at Summit. Okay. Yeah. Because there was an issue with Bear Mountain opening up their bike park because of the whole environmental issue. Yeah. Their old EIR says they, they, were, they were never allowed to expand the ski hill under the old EIR because of the spotted at Bear Mountain. Yeah, I, and I'm not aware of them opening up that park at Bear Mountain, but I, I know for a uh, snow zone. So that additional 120 acre feet that we were talking about is actually going towards their bike park at Snow Summit. It just looked like the, the orientation on the map with the little bit too far. It's a big logo. <laughs> <laughs> I might need to scooch it over a bit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so this graph and um, this black line here is historic lake level going back to 1977. Um, and so I'm going to layer on here is the estimated benefit from to the project lake level from this project. Um, and so you'll see that, and, and on the next slide, I'm going to show you the zoom in of the most recent period. Um, really, the most benefit happens during those, those low points, right? We do anticipate that the lake will continue to see these you know, sort of filling drain cycles. Um, but the point of this project is to, to kind of bring up those low lows so that we're not getting as far down as we've seen historically. And so here's a close up of what that looks like from the 2011 to 2019 period since the lake was last full. And so based on a detailed analysis that was done by um, MWD, um, and their water master consultant doing that water master model. We're seeing that based on historic hydrology and actual lake levels in the past, if this project had begun back then, we would have seen a four and a half foot increase um, in lake levels from that, that low low um, in 2018 when the lake was 18 foot two below the pole. So see when the lake is full, the you know the, the increment there is not as much, but the lake levels are already high. So as it starts to get lower, that's really where you accumulate those benefits. Just to clarify, uh, looking at the um, previous graph, um, when the lake is low, volume is low, and so the percentage of water going in is higher. In lake going in, that's what it's demonstrating during those periods of time. Yes, that and also, you know, sort of the, the shape of the lake. So when it's lower, you know, filling up that, that same amount of water sort of gives you more of a gain in lake level. Right. And when the lake is full, it's less clear. Right. Which logically would make sense. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. And then in the next slide, I'm going to show you what that looks like on a map. Um, that. Okay. So this, um, the blue there is. Um, an estimate of, of what the actual lake area was in December 2018 um, when you had that record low of 18 foot two below the pole. And so, of course, the Mike Marsh was, was in a place of dry um, and there was limited access to the lake in a lot of places. So, um, under those 2018 conditions, if the project had been in place, this darker blue here is the additional water coverage that you would have seen. So, you know, during extreme drought conditions, the lake will still see those tips, 
but you're not going to lose as much water coverage as you would without the project. And so that's what's shown here in the dark blue. The marsh, this, this outline here in the marsh, that's about the minimum that you'd ever see in the marsh. Um, so those culverts that go under the road between the marsh and the lake, it kind of acts as a weir. Um, and that will keep the marsh about this full, um, even if the lake is a little bit lower. So you'll see, you know, constant wet area in the marsh and an increase in that area. And this is really just at the at those minimum levels. You know, at you know, a few years before that, when it was low but not as low, you probably would see even more of a benefit. Yes. So this is on I think page 24. It's, it's the graph. Uh, it goes up and down with uh, little blue marks on it. Um, and this is an example for the cameras. Uh, in 2018, I'll call it mid 2018, the black line is water level, which is uh, minus 12. This is minus two there, but I think that means minus 12. Oh, yes. Um, and if it had been in place during that period of time, uh, the difference would have been a minus, I'll call it seven approximately. It was at eight, yeah. So it would have been about worth the difference at that time. Okay. Okay, so when the lake is low, it could be as much as a four foot difference. Yeah, based on you know the, the actual lake levels and the actual hydrology in that, that previous period, um the the model results showed up to four and a half feet um during 2018, which was the lowest. It so helped me a lot because sometimes it's hard to explain. Yeah. When the lake is low, the benefit is much higher. When we need it more when the lake is full, yeah, that's true. It's not the effect is small. Right. Okay. Yeah. I mean, there just simply isn't enough wastewater to treat to fill up the lake, right? But it's a smaller percentage against it is, 70, yeah. thousand acre feet, thousand yep. in. But when you're at 28,000 acre feet, 2,000 is a larger percentage. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. All right. I hate to jump back, but this is really like this. Well, it's new information and a new way of presenting it. And so um, we really wanted to, we're hoping that these resources are more helpful. So, you know, feel free to, you know, any questions I'd be happy to answer. I think this is information I want to make sure that you guys um, feel confident sharing. Yeah. And if there's anything else that would be helpful to add to this resource besides that, let us know when we can develop that as well. Very good. Just a quick question if I could. Um, I appreciate the visuals. Thank you very much. It's so helpful. Um, how long does it take to ramp up to that four and a half foot? If you well, understand what I'm saying. You know, I do, yeah. It's, and it depends on the natural hydrology, right? Sort of how much rain you get. But if we look at this period between 2011 and 2019, the lake was last full in 2011. So if, you know, if there was extra water, it may have spilled over. There were probably some flood releases at that time. So that sort of resets the benefits in a way, right? And so then you'll see that over the, you know, the course of those nine years that follow that were pretty dry, um, it, it slowly accumulates. Um, you know, each year you get that additional increment just from continuing to add this water source every single year. Um, and so the, the historic benefit that we've seen was up to four and a half feet. In the future, you know, we can use the history as an approximation of what we think might happen in the future, but it will, of course, depend on rainfall and lake levels as well. But um, I think this is a good um, comparison. Thank you. Okay, and then the groundwater benefits are, you know, also foundational to this project. And so um, what you're seeing here is projected groundwater pumping. Um, and this is from the groundwater sustainability plan that was adopted last year. And um, you'll see towards the end there, the line kind of fans out, and that just reflects uncertainty um, with what it will look like that far out to the future of 2070. Um, you know, if you don't increase your groundwater pumping, you're probably at the bottom level of that, and if it kind of goes at the same rate that it's been increasing, that's where that upper bound is. And then the black thing here is comparing it to the sea field of the groundwater basin. And so you'll see right now, there's a pretty significant buffer. It steps down there in 2040, just because that's the time period that DWR uses for their climate change models. And so they're anticipating that between 2040 and 2070, there will be a long-term decline in groundwater sustainable yield. Um, and so that's what's reflected here. It won't actually, you know, jump down in 2040, but that long-term future 
um, could be a lot closer to, to the groundwater pumping. Because there's no other source of water besides natural replenishment, um, this project, you'll see those, those blue lines there, they really grow that sustainable yield and give you more of a buffer, more reliability with the groundwater basin um, to be able to be resilient if, you know, if those conditions do occur in the future. That's the last one I have on benefits. Um, any other questions or information that would be helpful? The, the 500 acre feet, though, is an opportunity for the local water districts to take advantage of that. It, that it isn't actually part of the project. Yeah. Yeah, so the, the 500 acre feet reflects the total of the 388 acre feet that would be recharged in Camp Canyon and the 128 acre feet that would replace the golf course water supply that basically you leave the water in the ground for municipal use. So that's where that 500 total comes from. And, um, you know, that, that part, it, it is an integral part of the program, but it's not part of the borrowers funding. Is that accurate, David? Yes. Yeah. So is that part of the environmental document? Yes. Okay, I'm going to close this out. Um, so this is just a summary of program milestones. Most of this, this is a buildup of the milestones that you've seen previously. Um, so what we're really working on going forward is um, that, that pilot program that's going to be starting up here next month. Um, in June, uh, we anticipate an additional grant application for the rest of that Title 16 grant funding. And Barbara has also been invited to submit a Whitby loan. Um, and around that time, um, we'll be able to initiate final design as well, followed by adoption of the EIR in the fall, um, and then moving into construction in late 2024, um, operation beginning in 2027. That's the final time. Thank you.